All right, good afternoon, and we'd like to welcome you to the inaugural uh, Conversations with the Mayor. And my name is Marquez Slee, and we're so pleased to have you in our inaugural, uh, very first one, uh, series called Conversations with the Mayor, and we appreciate you joining us. We're going to be having these conversations periodically, and uh, the objective here is very simple. It's really to give you an opportunity to hear the latest in terms of what's happening across the great city of Pontiac, as well as across Oakland County. And also part of today's discussion, I'm very pleased to welcome Oakland County's Sheriff Michael Bouchard, who's gonna be joining the conversation as well. The, the topics to be discussed, social justice, public safety, we'll also be giving a state of the city address. I also want you to understand very clearly uh, that this is being recorded and also being shared now live via Facebook Live as well. And before we get started, uh, I, I, I'm a, I own my own business, the Lee Group. I also have a radio show here in town and I contribute to various media outlets here in the metropolitan area. All right, let's go ahead and jump right into the conversation. And uh, I would like to offer an opportunity to both the mayor and Sheriff Bouchard to start out with a comment or a statement as it relates to social justice and the current protests that are currently underway nationally and what's happening in the city of Pontiac as well. Mayor, let's start with you. Hello everyone, uh, Pontiac residents and those who are just friends of Pontiac, all are welcome for this conversation. And I thank you, Mark, um, as we have been approached with this double pandemic, I'm going to call it, one uh, health-wise, one of uh, this racial injustice that has seen a uh, voice all around the world in support of the voices that we hear uh, for change. Uh, and I thank you for helping us develop this format for getting out information uh, and for getting out conversation that we're now calling it. Uh, as we have been, particularly all of us sheltered in, we found the need to have more communication uh, for our public. And so we have found this format to bring that to people in a broader way. So thank you for agreeing to host that and we look forward to those periodic uh, sessions to come. And thank you, Sheriff Bouchard, for accepting the invitation to be here, particularly for this uh, uh, issue that is of preeminence in everybody's mind, <laughs> excuse me, around the world, sinus time, around the world. Um, and so the first pandemic, of course, is the COVID-19 that we're all faced with. Uh, and that has been a, 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 occupied a lot of people's attention uh, we certainly have worked together to find ways that communities can uh, give information, education, health and safety to the residents and uh, be able to handle that on a local level. And we thank all the first responders and the essential workers who've been an essential part of doing that. And uh, we count the sheriff's deputies among those first responders who have helped uh, to make this community safe during this COVID-19 emergency. But while we were doing that and learning how to hand this a pesky coronavirus virus, uh, in the midst of this, we had this unfortunate incident, uh, reprehensible incident in Minneapolis, Minnesota that we all know about. Uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds that uh, were played over and over again, which um, had to touch and her outrage in the heart of anybody who's human. Uh, and that, of course, uh, started with that incident uh, in which life was snuffed out um, and replayed over and over again, which sparked now a reaction uh, in many, many communities, also in Pontiac, where we've had a number of peaceful protests and demonstrations. But it's all around the world now. People who never met or never will meet uh, George Floyd, people who will never come to Minneapolis. But there was a sense that there was a sense of unity about outrage at this kind of so social injustice and the sense that this has gone on for too long. And this was something that America had to take its handle on. And people have marched and people have sung and people have cried together about where we are as a country. And this has really turned into something in which America is trying to find its soul. Um, and so as we have had those kinds of protests around the world, we've also had them in Pontiac. Uh, we've hosted some of them right here at City Hall because we felt it was important for pine voices to be heard. But after the marching, and we've been marching for a long time, you know, for racial justice and equality in this country, uh, what happens next? And what happens next, as we're seeing now, is uh, we want something to come. We want something to happen. We want some change 
uh, to be affected. And so this is our moment in time. And we realized that the change for a lot of these have to be local because policing and in this instance, the sheriff's department is a local phenomenon. And so what are we gonna do locally? And so I'm thinking that you are here, Sheriff Richard, to have that conversation to assure people that uh, what you're doing uh, as the sheriff's department and what the conversation we're having. So then we know Pontiac would not be one of those cities where we would see that kind of injustice delivered. And so you have a chance to do that and we have that conversation. But I would like to end my statement with a statement I read uh, to a protest group uh, on behalf of the city of Pontiac. And it goes um, pretty short. There is outrage throughout the nation over the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. I too feel the pain of yet another community that has been traumatized by yet another quote unquote street execution at the hands of hate-filled officers who were supposed to protect the public welfare and uphold our system of justice. Outright racism. It is a reality that haunts nearly every black man and black family in this country. And though America can call it by its rightful ugly name and deal with it head on, it will continue to fester. So in the streets of so many cities now, there is outrage. While we can't condone the destruction of our communities, we understand the underlying anger and frustration. Where is the will to find the solutions that will bring justice and fair treatment for all? How much longer will it take to get real policies in place that tackle this monster of racism that tears at the core of the American fabric of justice and peace. After 400 years from bondage to Jim Crow laws, lynchings, now street executions, marches, unequal pay, disproportionate sense names, so many Martin Luther King dinners, when will we finally see definitive change? Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wants to answer the question, quote, how long? Answer, not long. We're waiting. Only justice will bring peace. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and for all those of you joining us, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for conversations with the mayor. My name is Mark Lee. Sheriff Bouchard, we will turn over to you for a statement as well. Well, thank you. And uh, Mark, thanks for hosting, Madam Mayor. Uh, appreciate always being with you. Um, I put a pretty detailed statement out. It's on our Facebook page and it's on our, our uh, social media as well. So I, I won't read it again. I, I read it at that uh, rally that we had on the steps of City Hall. But uh, the summary of it is basically this, that you didn't have to be a member of the community of those that have felt this throughout the years, the community of color to look at that video and be angry to be shocked, to be outraged, and want justice. I felt the exact same thing, and I believe those officers should be held accountable, plain and simple. Um, I believe in our profession, but I also believe our profession, like every profession, has to root out those that shouldn't be in it, hold people accountable, and always strive for better. And in our office, we want everyone to be treated with dignity, to have justice, and to be treated with respect period. There's no caveats. There's no exceptions. Even someone that is under arrest deserves to be treated fairly and with respect. And so as I saw that play out in Minneapolis, I was angry and I wanted to see something happen as a result of it. And I have been actually calling upon uh, the legislature and Washington for many years to enact some legal changes. Much of what I suggest uh, in a paper that I wrote in 2014 called Policing 2.0, we have done internally within the Sheriff's Office. But a lot of things that we wanted to go further with, we couldn't do without changes in the law. Um, specifically, how we do background checks, how we make sure we screen out those that shouldn't come into our profession. Maybe they have a social media account where they're spouting racist and, and uh, homophobic or sexist things, but it's a private account, we can't see it. We want access to that so that we can screen that out and take them off our list to be hired. Those kinds of things are important. Better hiring, better backgrounds, a more diverse recruiting pool, meaning that we need people from the community of color and all walks of life, race, gender, preference, religion, 
All of those things make us better capable of understanding and better responding to the community we serve. So I would ask everyone that's on here that is watching that sees this when it's shared, please apply to the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. We need more men and women of character with more diverse backgrounds and recruiting is becoming more and more challenging. So please apply. The days ahead will need more people of quality and heart that want to make a difference in their community and want to help this move forward in a positive way. So a lot of those things are important. And then finally, once you trim down and make sure you're only getting the best of the best with good intentions that want to serve, not violate, that want to help, not uh, do other bad things. Once we do that, then we have to train relentlessly to make sure that they know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So we have the best chance for a safe and a peaceful outcome in every situation, de-escalation and all of the associated tactics that come with that. So we are with you. We want a better police outcome, not just in Pontiac, but everywhere in the nation. And when we have uh, something that goes awry and someone does something wrong, we hold them accountable. And that is the way it should be. All professions need to have that as a bar and we have it at the sheriff's office. I know the mayor is a physician, and we, we don't expect that all physicians are painted with the terrible stain that Dr. Nasser created across that profession, but people like Dr. Nasser need to be taken out of that profession, just like bad police officers need to be taken out of ours. So thank you for allowing me to join you today. Thank you, Sheriff. We appreciate it. We know that we are in trying times, very challenging times, no question about that. By the way, if you don't want to be seen, feel free to mute your video as well. Um, so I just want to make sure I I'll make, make that aware, make that option available for you. Um, we've also invited uh, to ask a couple of questions, Mr. Raheem Harris of the Pontiac Universal Crimes. Uh, Raheem, thank you for joining us. I know you have a couple of questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I would like to say to Mr. Bouchard, thank you so much for all you do. And thank you so much, Mayor, for all you do. But the first question I would like to ask, and I will, you know, I got three questions, but let's um, start off with the first question. Um, do we have body cameras or do we recommend body cameras to be utilized um, in the city of Pontiac? So um, I, I'll take that question because we're the agency that's in Pontiac. We do not have body cameras, we have dash cams. Um, I actually went to the legislature about five years ago and asked them to enact legislation to allow body cams to be focused on holding police accountable, but to protect the privacy of our citizens. And what I mean by that is that we see some of the most embarrassing, the most sad, the most heart-wrenching moments of people's lives. And if that body camera is on your chest, it sees it all too. So that should not, in my opinion, be public unless there's a complaint about the police behavior. If that happens, it should trigger a holding of the video, an investigation of the complaint, and then a release of the findings of the investigation and a release of the video. Police accountability. But outside of that, what happens in your life that's captured on that video, you should not be exposed to the public. And we've seen programs around the country under the Freedom of Information Act where TV producers will go in and say, I want every officer's camera for the last eight hours um, for the whole shift. And so you end up being part of this reality TV show without your permission. I remember when I was a young police officer, I responded to a woman that was getting out of the shower and slipped and got stuck naked between the bathtub and the toilet. If I had a body camera on, that would have all been captured. And that would have all been FOIAble under the previous uh, FOIA laws. Now they tried to change it and say, well, things that are private, reasonable expectation of privacy can't go public in your home and things like that. But what if you're in a car and having relations with somebody? I mean, there's so many private moments. So again, if we focus on police behavior, a complaint about a police conduct in a situation, 100% agree, it ought to be kept and released. But everything else should be off limits to protect your privacy. And the other challenge um, goes to the logistics and it gets way down the weeds. But if we get a request for eight hours of body cam footage, 
we have to sit someone down in front of a TV screen and watch the whole eight hours because federal law, as the mayor knows, requires us to remove HIPAA information and certain privacy things. So we can't release that video that has sat in. If we go to a medical situation and someone tells us what they're feeling, they're having chest pains, they give us their date of birth or their social security or whatever, all of that has to be redacted. So you have to have somebody go through the whole eight hours and cut out what by law we can't release and then release the rest. So it becomes a, a very challenging thing unless, again, you focus on police accountability, which I 100% support. Yes, sir, but I, I understand that that it is a challenging thing, but without the camera, we wouldn't have found out what happened to Mr. Floyd. That wasn't a police camera. I understand. It wasn't a police camera, but if it wasn't a camera there, we wouldn't have found out what happened. Well, you would have actually seen that in a, in a Pontiac situation because uh, all of our police cars, because they capture streets and things like that, we don't feel it's violating people's privacy all have cameras in the police car. So all the dash cams would have caught that. And they also have a recorder on their chest now. And that audio is all captured. So you would have, we would have been able to pick that situation up. Okay. And I agree, we, we would love to have body cameras, but we can't do it by violative of nature of our citizens that we're sworn to protect. Hold us accountable, have the footage focused on that, and then I think you'll see a robust investment in those cameras. Right now, most agencies don't have them um, for a lot of reasons, but that's the biggest impediment that I see, is that a lot of people will get published and broadcast in situations they may find embarrassing or personal or sad, like a rape victim um, that may be outside their home. At some point, all of that can become public under existing laws around the country. Focus on police accountability, hold the camera and release the footage on police accountability, 100% agree. Now, I, I, Raheem, I'm, I'm sensitive to the sheriff's time, so we have for a couple more minutes. I know you have a, another question, so please ask him this yeah. question. Okay, with all the um, brut police brutality going on, um, Mr. Bouchard, can you, um, can you let us know what's the procedure of an officer arresting us and what can we do where we will not be intimidated by the officer. Because when the first the officer comes to us, the first thing he says, get out your car, let me search you. Is we able to stay in the car, just give our information out the car and you know, what is our rights as a citizen? Right, well, I, it's, it's hard to broadly answer that because it depends on the situation. Um, sometimes they, they do have justification to ask you to exit your car. Um, and some circumstances that I've seen around the country, it's not warranted. But my, my answer that I always tell kids in school is that when you're, when you're told to do something by a police officer, comply. The place to fight that is in court. The best place to uh, a, you know, a, address a grievance is in a forum where people can be held accountable, not to necessarily argue it in the street because that's not the best solution. But having said that, all of our training goes to de-escalating a situation, trying to explain to people what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the situation will involve. And so in, in terms of all that, it, it's a very intense training process and that goes to the other part of the equation, training, training, training. Now, when I look at the Minneapolis video, I see one of two things or maybe both. I see an incredibly tragic situation that is driven either by terrible training or racism or both. Both are unacceptable. And so that's why you focus on trying to eliminate those that harbor a dark, evil heart out of the profession. And those that are making mistakes based on bad and improper training need to be retrained. And if they don't get it, then they can't stay, obviously. But training, training, training. The restraint that he was using on Mr. Floyd, completely unacceptable on every level and nothing we would ever do. Okay. Let me uh, add to that too, uh, Rahim, as a follow-up to your question. Uh, and they talked about in communities uh, where now the point is for local officials, elected officials, citizens, to hold their uh, police departments, uh, sheriff's departments accountable for safety and welfare in the community. Because that's their, their primary duty uh, in this community. 
and it's my primary duty as mayor for safety and welfare. So I wanted to assure that. So as we have these conversations, I have this conversation, Sheriff Bouchard and I had this conversation early on among my first uh, duties as uh, when I was the first elected mayor. And then Sheriff Bouchard and I have that understanding that we respect fairness and justice, and I'm going to support the uh, sheriff's deputies department and everything they do. They've done an enormous job, and I'm proud of the accomplishments and bringing down Pontiac violent crime 40% under this uh, partnership with the sheriff's department. Pontiac was at one time, 12 years ago, one of the 10 most violent cities in the United States. And now that has come down 40%. Our violent crime statistics, and Joe Richard has published this all over because he's proud of it too, are the same as any major city in Oakland County. So we can stand that. And that's why now uh, we've got a different reputation and businesses are starting to come back to the city of Pontiac. And we think that has happened with the partners, the sheriff, the, uh, the partnership with the sheriffs and the sheriff and his deputies. And many of them, so many of them are great, proficient, and they have done a tremendous job for this community. So I thank you for that, Sheriff. But by the same token, um, there are complaints sometimes that come up in any community. Uh, the sheriff has set up the sheriff relations team. And I said, if that team works well for handling those complaints and making sure this fair justice and treatment is handled, then I will not evoke my authority under the city charter to appoint a police review board. But if I felt that that was not happening in this community, believe me, I would and I will. But uh, the sheriff is here now, and I'm so happy he's accepted this invitation. So, so we can say we've had that conversation. It needs to continue on. And uh, that's why we're here today. So thank you for your questions as well. And I just wanted to add on that additional point of interest. And, and before we got to Sheriff, he really has to have one final question. Um, and the question is relates to the sheriff. Let me ask you specifically, are there rear cameras on police vehicles as well, Sheriff? Rear cameras? Yes, yes. Oh, that face out the back of the car? Yes, yes. Are, are, the cam are there cameras on the back of the vehicle as well? No. Okay. No, right. they're, not, they're dash cams. Okay. And they, they capture what's in front of the vehicle, and they also capture the audio of the officer. So when he approaches a car, that whole audio interaction. So if, if somebody is saying something inappropriate, if they're impolite, if they're not showing uh, proper procedures, proper respect, all that's captured. And when we have wrongdoing, I believe we own it, fix it, and are transparent about it. And, you know, tragically, we've had to do that on a couple occasions, as the mayor knows, where we found a situation that occurred that shouldn't have occurred, and, and we've held people accountable. Um, Absolutely. But again, we're like all other professions. We have uh, folks that make mistakes. We're all human. When it's a mistake, we fix it. If it's evil intention, we remove it. And that's our intent. And I would also say to the mayor, we appreciate the partnership uh, with her administration and the city uh, on the crime situation. As, as she mentioned, Pontiac was in the top 10 most violent cities in America. Now, the last list, we weren't even in the top 100. And uh, 911 res response time went from 80 minutes down to all priority calls about six. So, you know, we want to keep doing better and get better. And with the community's involvement and support and participation, and yes, criticism. When you do something wrong, let us know. But also, don't be afraid to tell the deputies when they do something right. So yes. We love the relationship. But Sheriff, 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 I want to thank you. I know you, I know you have to go. We thank you for your time. and appreciate you joining us. Uh, we'll have you back on in a not-too-distant future to continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Sheriff. Thanks, sir. Okay. Um, Mayor, uh, we're going to go back over to the mayor. Again, we're having conversations with the mayor, Mayor Waterman, and an opportunity to ask questions. We have questions. We're just having a casual conversation here. Mayor, I want to ask you, uh, from your perspective, what's next? What's next you know, as it relates to social justice and, and the protesting that's been, that's been coming down the pike? From your perspective as the leader of this city, of this region, of the city in the region, what's next? Several things. One thing is that the community needs to know uh, what is being done, what is the accountability of their sheriff's department. That's why we have this conversation today, uh, particularly in view of what's happening not only in uh, Pontiac, but uh, in the rest of the country and around the world. Uh, there's a great cry and push for justice now. Uh, things that we have long awaited that are still overdue. 
Uh, and so now people are coming together and realizing it's, it's, it's more than the marching. And that's good, but that's brought attention to it. But we're linked hand in hand with this. And this is something that has affected this country for a long time. So now we've got to see if we can't take up the banner for some of the other things in terms of social justicing. Um, in this community, we'll continue the conversations. You know, we'll continue to have those discussions with the uh, sheriff's department. This isn't okay. the first time we've done that. We've had town halls before in which the sheriff was gracious enough to come and was answering a lot of the questions. Those people have a right to know. This is a large part of our budget, you know, from the police and fire. That's about uh, three fifths of the budget that the, we have. So the health and wealth, uh, health and safety of our citizens is one of the first responsibilities, I say, of the community. Uh, and it's the thing that attracts and retains citizens to live in the community. So that's very important. As new businesses come in and say, uh, are considering Pontiac, one of the first things they ask me is, how safe is your sister city? So uh, the fact that I can cite these statistics and, fight, and state the fact that we have a working relationship with our sheriff's deputies and our sheriff's department. And I wanna make sure the citizens know that they have that arm and that voice through me and also uh, direct direct as we've had it today, as we will continue to have that. But in addition to that, there's a larger job to be accomplished. And those are things that um, are being dressed in city halls and in Congress uh, all over. And we wanna be part of that. We wanna have plenty of voices heard about how that is decided. For example, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus announced some legislation they're introducing. Certain things is outlawing uh, certain tactics. The tactics of a chokehold uh, is above and beyond what's needed to control a violent situ situation. They're gonna also respond, um, ask for legislation for additional uh, mitigating uh, agencies and training uh, and other things. And that can be read uh, online uh, for those. And we also have it online on our website as well. But we wanna have to make sure that's happening here because a lot of the effect happens with our own local legislation. So that's why we want people to be informed about the power that they have to affect change. And we wanna affect the changes that are needed right here in our own community here in Pontiac. And that's why we wanted people to be informed and know of the opportunities to do that. And that's why we're launching this series, uh, Conversations with the Mayor on a monthly basis. We'll give you more information towards the end. And, and before we move, segue briefly into the State of the City preview, Mayor, uh, there's been a lot of discussion as it relates to defunding the police. We're hearing that you know, locally, nationally. Uh, what are your thoughts as the Mayor of Pontiac in, in the context of quote, defunding the police. It means so many different things to different people. What yes. does that mean to you? What's your perspective? Well, when you say defunding, I think people um, mainly mean we need more funds to be put on things other than locking people up and, and addressing crime. We need to address some of the things that will have more of a community effect on people's lives and people's having to. And so the extent that we're supporting other groups who are helping to build the strength of our community uh, to augment our citizens, you know, uh, for example, uh, we have with this COVID-19, which is also the emergency going on right now, but the federal government has brought in money and funds uh, to help people, you know, so they're not thrown into desperate situations. Um, one of the things they say about George Floyd was that he was a man who had lost both of his jobs in this COVID emergency. And what he was trying to do was to pass off a counterfeit $20 bill so he could buy some food. So uh, that, that's how they got caught up in this. And that's not excusing it, but that's just what the um, angst people are feeling in this COVID emergency. So as we have examples, as money that's come to Pontiac uh, from the federal government called CARES, and it's under the block grant fund. And uh, I recommend to the council, and they did support, that we want all of that money to go to helping people uh, pay mortgage assistance, rental assistance, and utility uh, payment assistance because people need that help. You know, unemployment's gonna run out uh, the way it stands right now, next month. So how do people who, whose jobs have been threatened, who haven't gone back to jobs, who have to stay at home taken care for, people who have been affected by that or their children, uh, how are they gonna to continue to survive? So those are the things that we can as a community also lend to help people uh, in these emergencies. So in addition to the fact that we're continuing to have these discussions, continue to be part of groups that work for uh, to re reduce and curb violence and also to help people. Uh, for example, one of the groups that had a demonstration was the Moms Demand Action Against the Violence, Illegal Guns. 
uh, right on the City Hall front steps. Uh, so there are many groups now who are joining to hear that, as well as the people who are helping with reentry programs to make sure that people have a productive way to restore their lives if they have been incarcerated. Also, they're not coming back as non-productive um, members of the society. Uh, so we want to continue to do that. Often we'll use these conversations to have what specifically is going on and how people can be a part of those movements, because it is a movement. It is a movement now. Uh, and uh, for people who, as I said, don't know anything about Minneapolis, but there is a sense that uh, around the world, the distance of angst and things that some things are not going along the right way. And we want to change. People want change. I understand that change. And uh, I want to help to be um, a vehicle for that voice of protest and change. Good. Thank you. And, and as we, I want to segue, uh, I, I'm sensing everyone's time. We appreciate you all joining the, us. If you're missing any part of this, this is on Facebook Live, so you can pick up the recording there. This has also been recorded and will be dropped across all Pontiac social media platforms as well as some local cable stations as well. Uh, Mayor, upcoming, can you give us a preview, if you could, of the upcoming State of the City address and talk specifically about the expectations of the areas of focus? Yes. Um, so the city, State of the City address is something that, uh, uh, by the charter, uh, I do once a year, and then I do it in June, a uh, good time of the year. Uh, this year we were challenged uh, because um, we, don't, we didn't know whether we we're going to have to do it all virtual as much as this. But as people were coming out and the fact that um, we now have uh, United Shore, which has agreed to host it again, I always try to have it at a local place, a different place each year so people can see uh, some of the uh, wonderful uh, uh, institutions and, and venues that we have right here in Pontiac. Uh, so it's going to be um, a hybrid this year. You know, we're challenging to find new ways of doing things. Uh, so we can limit it to 100 people coming in. So that's going to be more for uh, guests who RSVP, including my Partners in Progress awardees, who will be there. Each year I, I award people who have helped or organizations who have helped with the progress of the last year. And there's some very distinguished um, actors in that role. Uh, but also this year, the theme is going to be the change that has come to Pontiac. Because we're going to talk about, revisit what it was uh, six years ago, 10 years ago, uh, and what we see now. For example, uh, we had neighborhoods pocketed with, uh, with derelict homes and boarded up homes. We have now completed that flight project and what that looks like and what that has done to property values and people's pride in their neighborhoods. How we've strengthened the neighborhoods, how we now uh, have been able to attract re and retain businesses we never could before. Uh, we now have, as we speak, uh, 39 new building projects happening in Pontiac. That's the most new building projects we've had since the early days of General Motors, including uh, Amazon, which is coming. Uh, they've already finished their first building. We'll have the second building done uh, next year. And that's the first time anywhere in the United States that they have been able to build both facilities on one site at the Silverdome site. And that's happening right here in Pontiac. So we're going to tell people what's going on uh, in their community uh, as they see that Pontiac uh, we want to be a, a healthier, brighter, um, safer, and a beautiful city, realizing the uh, county seat um, privileges as well as reputation that we have and a new narrative about Pontiac being a comeback city. And all the people have helped to do that. So I've got a lot to report. There's a lot going on, and we hope those will uh, join us. It's going to be June 25th, Thursday evening, starting at 6.30, and uh, we'll have more information coming forth uh, soon. Well, Mayor, anything that you want to say in closing as we wrap up uh, this very first, our inaugural conversation with the Mayor of the series? Anything you want to say in, wrap, in, in closing? I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's stimulated discussion. Uh, you know, in the uh, half hour or so that we have a chance to talk, I just want to make sure that people know, even though we've been sequestered and sheltered in, uh, uh, in our own homes or places where some of us are essential workers have to, had to go into work. A lot of people are in City Hall, even though it's been closed to the public for a while. But that we're all in this together. It's an extreme privilege for me to uh, be mayor of a city. Uh, and I am here uh, because of the passion I feel about the things and we want to live in a community uh, that we can be proud of. Uh, it's been my privilege to be elected, privilege to be a citizen here. And uh, I just want to make it a better place. And that's my commitment to the citizens. And I appreciate all those who've stepped up in whatever way, 
uh, who said, uh, Mayor, what can I do? And they stepped up to do things in, in, in a variety of ways. There's a huge group that's meeting now that's going to open it up uh, as we once had this community input. Uh, and I'm just proud of the things we've accomplished together. Uh, we're in this together. We're going to get through this COVID-19 together. Uh, and uh, we're just offering some new things. We're about to have our own city app. We're going to launch that pretty soon so we can communicate better with people. But I'm just happy that uh, people are here and interested in the city of Pontiac. Uh, we've now got uh, our name back on the map again, and that's a good thing. So I think everybody who has an interest who's here in whatever way, whether you're resident, non-resident, uh, I'm just thankful and I'm glad to be in Pontiac. Yeah, Mayor, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Sheriff Bouchard and also the mayor for uh, this conversation today, our very first one. Um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. You can watch it as soon as we, uh, as soon as it's downloaded, as soon as it's over across the city's uh, social social media sites as well. Uh, the mayor also will be on my radio show uh, a couple of Sundays from now. I believe it's June twenty first. You can listen to her. She'll be on with me. We're going to continue this conversation on the airwaves at nine ten a.m. at nine ten a.m. the Superstation um, on that Sunday between eleven o'clock and one o'clock. And then we're going to run this program. We're going to do it again next month in July. We'll get the information out to you in advance so that you can plan to participate. I want to take this opportunity again. Thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day for this brief conversation with the mayor. And go out and make it a great day and stay safe. And we'll talk to you.